energy when the don't you just love the energy when the doors open, um, Christine, and people start coming in? It's like, woohoo! <laughs> you feel the buzz, the energy. It's awesome. And you're so sweet. And you bring us joy, too. We're so excited for all the work that you did. That is so cool. Aww. Man, it's so good to see you, Miss Sue. Shelly, awesome. Michelle, you and I had a great call yesterday. That was so much fun. Um, Darcy, Wesleyan College Alumni Association. <laughs> air conditioning <laughs> Woohoo! we need to think it's great um okay jonah you mentioned being able to travel again so where did you travel what was your first trip out um we got lots of cool people coming in um uh, this is super exciting christine and i are like we're stoked we are totally stoked for this conversation today yeah, I see all kinds of uh, people I've known for a long time. There's brand new folks. So we've got a great mixture. I love it. I love and everybody's it. taking time out on, you know, busy end of the month, maybe end of the annual um, fiscal year for you, hump day. So thanks for joining us on a, a midweek little brain break, hopefully for you. Yes. Well, I know we got people still coming in the door, um, but let's go ahead and just kind of queue up the conversation and, um, and so we can dive in. Uh, Christine and I have a lot to talk about today. I mean, not that there's ever, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, not enough to talk about, but you know, what brought us today to this conversation is quite frankly, we know our chapters are struggling to find volunteers. And probably even worse than that is they can find bodies occasionally, but they don't have the skills or the mindset. And yeah, it's time, it's time commitment required. It's, it's, it's that missing connection to meaning, it's lack of skills and experience, all of those things. Now, <laughs> a caveat, we're not going to address all of them here, but we are going to address that last one about skills and experience. And we're going to address that because it can connect in so many ways with the other issues that we have. It can become motivation, which, and it can, and it can, and it can really help define the meaning. And so we can connect with those things. So we're going to focus on that. Um, I always like to, um, you know, get us started with something that's going to really um, help us uh, think a little bit differently. So I'd like you in chat. What's a great learning experience you've had recently? Now could be personal, could be professional. Um, I started in January Tai Chi, which is obviously very personal. And yet I feel like it connects to my, my professional self as well. And it's been an amazing learning journey. And so I'd love to find out what are some of the learning journeys that you have been on um, in this past, in, 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 you know, recently or in this past COVID year or whenever. So I'll let people kind of warm up there. An excited volunteer training. I'm just going to be excited of opportunity to connect. All right. Uh, oh, Diana, yes, I took the same uh, program. It was amazing. Um, and I love Sue's comment about Foresight Works. We really tapped into that for this conversation. A Pound Pro, I love that. Um, oh, yes, I love a syncing PowerPoint with voiceover. So you guys keep putting it in there. Um, and while you do, I want to just mention that, of course, this, um, this opportunity, this conversation is brought to you by Bill Highway um, and uh, Mariner Management. Now, for, for, for Bill Highway, um, I always, I, I love the fact that they've got so many answers to how can I track and measure my component uh, performance. And so it is um, always a wonderful partner to have for us and really for the CRP community. Um, Mariner, as many of you know, we do a variety of things around the chapter work and we're always open to having conversations. The reason why the two of us come together is really to build the, commu the community of component professionals. That's our goal. Um, I'm super excited to say that coming up next, so save the date on July 21st, we're going to spend a lunchtime doing a chapter benchmark in a pep rally. Now, many of you got that maybe sad um, uh, email that we're not doing a traditional CEX this year. We are, however, doing a really incredibly 
deep dive into what do we all need? What do we all need to help our components really, um, really connect? And so the, the benchmarking is going to be different. And I want to just real quickly mention this to you. First of all, we're going to engage CEOs. So we want your, if you're not the CEO, we want your CEOs and in stage one of the, of the benchmarking. We need to hear from you, obviously, right? But then we're also, for a subsection of people who are interested, we're going to go out to your chapter leaders or chapter staff and have and invite them in to the survey conversation. So let me just say that again, it's going to have CEOs, it's going to have your chapter leaders, and it's going to have you. And we're going to talk about this and we're also going to get information from you um, on the 21st. So please be there or be square. Okay. Anyway, I am like over the moon. Um, I have known um, my wonderful person to my virtual, right? Um, Christine for quite a while. We met when she was um, with the Healthcare Association and she was asking this incredible question around how do I really optimize the engagement of the volunteers into our association? And very importantly, how do I optimize the partnership that my volunteers and volunteer groups have with staff. And that's how we started having the connection when she transitioned from there into this incredible um, organization, uh, Crystal Lake Partners. She and I kept talking. And one day I saw this amazing piece, a blog that she had written. She's a big foresight works person, right? So she's always looking for what are the trends that are taking us in a new direction. She mentioned this idea of learning journeys and, and how do you connect them with what our members and volunteers need. So anyway, we started talking. In any case, um, I'm super excited that she is here and we were able to put together um, this conversation. Christine, ah, welcome. <laughs> Take a breath, Peggy. <laughs> well, I thank you, uh, Peggy. Uh, I'm thrilled to be a part of this whole our own journey of exploration of thinking about how to connect learning journeys to the volunteer uh, training dynamic. And I've so enjoyed working with you and our advisory panel as we really put pen to paper and explored a whole bunch of ideas. Uh, this has been part of kind of my journey from going, as you said, from staff and working with volunteers as staff into a consulting role and working with a variety of associations. So we're just thrilled to be having the opportunity to bring this to everybody and see what everybody's uh, reactions are to it. So um, right back at you, Peggy, we're really thrilled to be working together and let's see what everybody has to say. Excellent. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And speaking of that, Christine, we've got a number of people who were sort of uh, involved in this project um, on, the, uh, on, the, on the call with us today. We've got Anne, I know we have Anne, and I know we have Michelle and Diana, who I'm not sure if I missed anybody else. I think Becky uh, Permensa was going to be on, but I'm not sure she's actually joined us yet. But everybody who was part of the advisory panel, we so appreciate all of their time. Yes, certainly. <laughs> and insights and just, you know, really being candid and honest with us and, you know, tearing it back bare where the you know, real problems are. Uh, so we're just thrilled to have them and they were a great brain trust for us. So, you know, the two of us, you know, took the lead, but it was, there's so many people involved with this whole process. Right. And I think the really cool thing about this is that- oh, Becky's here. She just chimed yes, in on the chat. Great. I love it. I love it. Um, is that the, um, uh, the the training our ability to give the right training is um is is important um it is actually the lack of is behind the problems we have right the decision to volunteer said the key reason for no is i didn't have the skills or knowledge the mutually beneficial volunteering said hey the dissatisfied dissat, big dissatisfier for volunteers was inadequate and adequate orientation training and resources and even the chapter benchmarking report said that one of the biggest disconnects is alignment all of these are training related right well see the cool thing is it also is drives some ROI. It drives the ROI for the volunteers who now have a perk, there's a commitment to them and to the association through better volunteers. So all of this is the reason why we are coming together to have this conversation. Now, a little caveat, I'm gonna put a poll up and I'm gonna ask us to ask you to tell us how does your association approach investing in volunteer training? 
And as I do that, I want to mention that one of the things that Christine and I have said over and over again is, can we strike that word training? Because the training has this sense of we tell you what you need. And we really want to shift that to um, a, a competition around learning. Um, and so a little bit more on that coming down. So I love this. I'm seeing that many of you say they provide some developmental and leadership training. Uh, some are say we provide basic tactical training. And a couple of you are saying uh, training. Um, <laughs> so this makes good sense. We've got, uh, most of you have weighed in at this point. Let me give you a, a, a few more seconds here. We've got, uh, I'm gonna count back from five, put those, put those uh, votes in for a three, a two, all righty. Let me show you where it ended up. All right, so many of you have some developmental and leadership training, love to see that. Uh, some have basic tactical training and some say they don't train their volunteers at this point in time. So that's okay because we've got some ideas here we think are gonna change that conversation. So. And Peggy, I'll just chime in here. We had a little bit in the chat here about, you know, I think whether where you are in your, your phase of offering training, everybody feels like there's gaps. And so I think, you know, we're always looking for ways to, to up the level of our training in some ways. Absolutely. In fact, that's what we're going to talk about today, right? It's filling some of those gaps. I, I love that because we're going to talk about the volunteer matrix, how we connect that to the learning map. Um, and then sort of the power of putting that into a training strategy. Uh, now, just so you guys know, um, what we've got here uh, is going to be a series of resources for you afterwards, including this toolkit um, that our advisory panel helped us with. It is a journey, a deeper journey through what we're going to be talking about today. We will have a link um, available to you, uh, as well as you will get a link in the follow-up. So you'll have lots of that, uh, lots of that. We're also doing a series of blog posts, which are going to go deeper into different parts of this. So we have lots of resources coming from you. But let's get started with this conversation around pathway and matrix. So what I wanna show with, sh start off the conversation is, let's be clear about what a typical volunteer pathway is. Let's be kind of clear for the moment that we really have five learning and developmental stages. From that moment when they're new, or I call them emerging volunteers in their first simple job, to where they become, they get on a team, or they're in a longer role of some sort, which we call the really truly the learning volunteer. Then they take that first step as a chair or a co-chair, or maybe a lead project. Um, then eventually they become an experienced volunteer leader in our chapters. And in this particular case, I'm we're going to suggest that the strategic volunteer leader means they're ready for national service. Now, if I was sharing this with a, a someone at the at the national level, I would what I would be talking about here is that the board service is the strategic volunteer. But for the chair, in many cases, our our component chair is going to be at that experienced volunteer leader. And if we want successful transition to the national level, we have to be cognizant of the differences that are needed that. So what needs to be baked in? So the way you pull these two pieces together is, is you have these five levels and in each level, there is a piece of, if you will, one of four content buckets. So there's the institutional knowledge about the given organization. <clears throat> so Maryland Recycling Network is the group, one of the, one of the groups we're home to. It's about understanding what MRN is about. It's about understanding our mission, our vision. It's about understanding our strategic plan and our membership offerings. Now, association governance is about the principles of, of nonprofit organizations because they're different than for-profits, right? Then obviously there's gonna be some specific knowledge, uh, specific um, skills that are being required. And then there are those leadership or those soft skills. And in some cases could be viewed as technical skills. So the reason why I'm sharing this with you, I think inherently we know this. The important thing is, is that each of these levels, there's a basic, a detailed and a strategic view of this. So there's a basic institutional knowledge, but by the time they are on the board of your chapter, that institutional knowledge should include the relationship between the national or the HQ, the global and that particular component. 
it's also important when you do this is for you to be able to then view and say, what do I need to teach versus what can I automate? So what are the pieces of this that allow me to apply technology so that I'm not teaching them something they're only going to use it a couple of times, but I am teaching them those important skills, say, around leadership or association governance, the fiduciary experiences. So there's a broader um, view of this in the toolkit, but let me just show you how this might pull out in terms of a matrix. So this would be considered the new volunteer leader. And in your matrix, you would probably identify the member characteristics, the association specific knowledge, that's your organization, the governance, what is this about not being a nonprofit, the general skills required for that particular role and the volunteer roles. When you set a matrix up, you're gonna be doing somewhat general in how you approach this, right? But you would be, for example, looking at the association specific knowledge, you would be saying, well, it's important that you understand the structure and how the communities work together. So how do the different components work together and how do they work together in the context of, of a national or a larger organization? And you also want to have that basic understandings of the governance models and things like that. In association governance, you're going to be taking, talking a look at the just the basics of what is a not-for-profit, how they operation, the basics of what it means as a volunteer leader to understand your responsibilities around the fiduciary uh, financial uh, risk mitigation. Um, and then there's going to be some, obviously, some general skills. And in many cases, um, you're going to be you're going to be applying in your matrix, okay what are the roles that a new volunteer leader could be in? So let's take this to the next level, just to give you some comparison here, understanding that again, this is a little bit generic and there is more detail in that toolkit. But notice the difference here. If they're an experienced volunteer leader, they're going to be, let's say, for example, a chapter chair or president. We expect them to have a full understanding of the many workings of the association. Uh, and of course it's programs and it's initiatives. We expect them to have a full understanding of legal and governance responsibilities. They should understand succession planning and volunteer recognition and development. And they should have a full understanding of, of the duties of, of care and um, loyalty, et cetera, that are important. So then the question becomes, what are the general skills? And this is where we sometimes fall down. We do a good job of making sure they know what are the duties of and what are the, but do we know, do we teach them how to think strategically? Do we help them understand how to manage resources through others? Do we make sure they have a basic understanding of cultural diversity? Right, Diana said she was in the, the DEI course from the University of South, South Florida. I was in that too. That Some of that information there was tremendous and our volunteer leaders need to have that as well. So let me take this and let's apply this to a pathway at a potential chapter level. Now understanding this is generic, it's gonna be different, but I, someone had asked in advance, can you show us how we might map this on a chapter? All right, new volunteer, what do they need? orientation to the chapter, the association and role. What impact can you have introducing leadership development opportunities? That's the impact you have, that's the ROI, right? A group member, so now they're part of a committee or a team, they need to know the group charge, they need to know the policies and procedures, they need to know how a nonprofit works. Your impact for helping them, you're preparing them for leadership. You're giving them those soft skills that they need. Now they become a chair. Um, Let's see, when, when you say you can have, you mean HQ or the chapter? Yes, yes. So thank you, thank you for asking that question. When I'm saying the impact that you can have, I'm talking about you HQ, by, by baking in to your volunteer processes, some robust thinking around uh, uh, leadership development, the ROI back to your organization is that you are bringing through this farm team. You are helping them make better decisions. You are helping the chapter volunteers able to make good decisions around alignment questions. So what I wanted to do in this was to show this is what the volunteer needs and this is where you HQ can have an impact. So thanks for asking that clarification. So a chair, we know that they need those things. So what is, 
what's the what's the ROI back to you? The impact is that you are sharpening their leadership skills and building strategic mind muscle. The strategic muscle is critical because when we have a misalignment or when you're trying to do something, a big change, and you can't get it through because you have chapter leaders like this. Yeah, guys, it's because we haven't taught them to be strategic. Let's talk about the board member of the officer at the local level. They have, they really need to have that connection to HQ and understand the market and the member, the market and the member, not just how to do a, not, not just how to do an operational plan, but what do I need to know about thinking strategically around the market? So when you help them think strategic, when you help them to understand the difference between market and member and the other trends that are floating around, you are preparing them for national service, which quite frankly could be awesome opportunity for an HQ volunteer, a future leader. So that's, again, this is just one view of looking at this. So throw into chat as, as, um, as we switch to the next slide, Throw into chat, if you will, um, a, a conversation around how does this match up to what you're seeing? How does this match up to what you're seeing in your components? All right. So I will tell you that the value is real. I'm just going to give you three, um, uh, two things that I think are really important for you to think about. First of all, volunteers. Um, it helps frame the scopes, the competencies, and, and the prerequisites for opportunities. They have a better, clearer understanding as they're walking, walking through the pathway. Um, and secondly, it helps folks that are volunteer mentors and recruiters to guide volunteers to the right one. And third, it really helps if you start thinking about this this way, it can help you map out your training. All right. Um, Let's take a look at a poll. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share the poll and give the mic over to Christine. Sorry about that. I was on mute. So as we uh, have people start filling out the poll, we want to just get a, a, a pulse of what does your current volunteer training program look like? You know, are you just barely keeping up with your operations and can't even think about getting to training? Uh, maybe you're covering the basics or you feel like you've got a pretty robust training system and you're in pretty good shape. So kind of think about where are you right now? And we see everybody, it's flowing in. Um, wow, overwhelmingly already we're looking at, you've got some basics, but would like to do more. Uh, I'd be surprised if this is gonna change based on how it's looking. Um, a few of you are just barely keeping your head above water. And a few of you feel like you've got a pretty robust system. So um, Peggy, do we have most of the people have voted yes, already? Yeah, there we go. Yeah. So overwhelmingly, 73% of you say you've got something in place, but you would like to do more. Well, here we're going to be giving you some tips and ideas of how to do more. And one of the things that um, I want to emphasize is that as we go through these different models and these processes is that when Peggy and I in the advisory group were developing these concepts, we wanted to very carefully keep in mind that everybody's busy. You've already got full plates. And so what we are suggesting are ways that perhaps you can think about adding in some new elements that enhance your program and are not just busy work. You know, this kind of goes back to the mutually beneficial volunteer relationships paper where, you know, we need to make this work on both sides. We need to make volunteerism work not only for the volunteers, but we need to make it work for you, the component relations or the uh, volunteer relations professionals. So when we talk about this, we're really trying to develop tools and resources that are completely useful for you not creating busy work in any way. So with that context, let's dive in a little bit into the learning journey concept that Peggy mentioned at the outset. Christine, so we, can, I just, can I just make one kind? I love, sure. um, uh, Diana said, conversely, I think the HQ board needs training on the importance of components <laughs> and affiliates. And I, 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 amen to that, amen to that. <laughs> right, you know, and that's so true. Um, you know, we had several folks um, talking to us about how, they wanted tools and language of how to make the case for investing in your volunteer programs and your chapter programs. Hopefully some of what we're providing today provides a little bit of that language to help you message this to those 
who control the resources. So yeah, we're, we're on board with all of that. So, okay, the learning journey. So um, when you're thinking about adults learning, there is a process that we tend to go through. It starts with this uh, idea of preparation where you're getting yourself ready to take on a learning uh, process. Then you start to acquire uh, knowledge and skills. Um, then you start to use the skills. And then finally you have to, you know, those new muscles you flex, you have to maintain them. You have to do that daily workout on a regular basis. So when you think about a learning journey, it acknowledges that we have a diversity of experiences and goals. And we go through these steps along the way. When we uh, take this uh, approach to thinking about the process of learning, it allows us to first step back and say, where is the volunteer coming from and what do they need to learn? And then what is the process that they have to go to and how can we then match the training and development to the person's situation? This approach empowers you to have a multiple set of offerings to, for the volunteer, but also empowers the volunteer to pick and choose the, uh, what they need for the learning, to develop skills in different areas where uh, the timing might be just right for that uh, development and learning, or it might be a specific skill that they're looking for. So this shows the value of how, if you take a learning journey and offer a variety of modules to folks, this shows a value. It's, it's like a give back to the volunteers. It's a way for them to learn and grow. We're all looking for those new what's in it for me solutions for members and volunteers. This can be part of that where we're getting back to them and helping them understand that there is this structure for a broad array of training programs. And ultimately, you're gonna end up with a better prepared volunteer. Peggy mentioned that, that strategic level volunteer. That's what we are really wanting to have come to your national level for that governance service is that we heard over and over again from CEOs saying, you know, my board is not strategic, they're tactical. Well, no wonder because we've asked them to do tactical volunteering all along and we've never trained them how to be uh, strategic. So this gives you a sense of how to develop that whole learning process. So let's dive in a little bit further into this idea of two different kinds of learning. We have transactional versus developmental. So training or transactional, this is what we probably live in most of our time. We're really good at providing our volunteers the training about the specifics about the association, um, you know, the rules and responsibilities, how to do their volunteer job, um, you know, how to log into systems, where the files are, what the deadlines are. We spend a lot of time doing that transactional training. And that's really important. And I don't want to minimize that in any way. You've got that down pat. What we're saying is layer on top of that these developmental or leadership cultivation training modules where we're going into those strategic areas like having a future mindset, foresight, how to lead, how to communicate effectively, how to have those difficult conversations, you know, negotiation, consensus building. These are all areas, those what we typically call soft skills are things that we can add in for development. I recently heard of a new way to describe this as not soft skills, but power skills. And I love that phrase that if we really want to develop our volunteers to be true strategic leaders for our organizations. Let's power them up. Let's give them those power skills and add in that developmental training. And so great, we, we're gonna start using power skills instead of soft skills. So when we, um, if you take this pro idea of transactional versus development, but then let's layer into that that idea that we're all starting from different places. And that means that we as volunteers and all of your volunteers out there, they come to your organization with many different motivations. They may want to just give back to the association. They're very senior in their careers. They don't really have much for uh, need for professional development, but they want to give back as an example or maybe they are um, trying to develop a new network. They're a younger professional where they want to find um, other colleagues that they can have as their cohort and um, really rely on them. Maybe they just wanna get, it's an access point. It's a way to get more engaged with the association. So think about different volunteer motivations. And Peggy just put into the chat a good question. 
you know, what's your motivation for volunteering or what are some of the motivations you hear from some of your volunteers? Go ahead and put those in the chat so that we can capture those and maybe expand on this list. What's not on this list that you might have see as other motivations for volunteering? Sometimes it's just learning a new skill. I sometimes volunteered because I wanted to learn the latest about a trend, for example, in uh, the healthcare, because I used to work for a lot of healthcare associations, I would volunteer and I'd want to hear, learn more about trends in the industry. So what other kind of motivations are you hearing from folks? Be a part of the community. I love that. Any others? Ah, <laughs> the famous credits. Yeah, that'd be great if you can have, get credit for volunteering. Um, and I think that just reinforces that volunteering builds your skills. Because a lot of times recertification is a skill building piece, uh, engagement, involvement, networking. So we're seeing a lot of those common job search. Ah, that's another form of networking, isn't it? It's to help you get a new job. You know, either um, you are in between jobs or you're trying to find that next job, that next promotion. So for sure, those are all great motivations. So now let's go to the next slide and dig a little bit deeper into motivations and how we map this to the training and development concept. So I'm gonna walk you through both of these scenarios here. So one motivation is I want to build a technical skill for my current job. I'm pretty happy where I am, but I wanna sharpen some technical skills. So I might volunteer to edit a chapter newsletter um, to develop those editing skills and writing skills. So that's your training, it's the mechanics of how to edit the chapter newsletter. But then the developmental skills is to, oh, let's add the diversity inclusion lens onto this. And how do I communicate with care and understanding and um, in, uh, inclusion? And so think about those developmental skills, even for something as um, possibly considered you know, very tactical, but you can layer those developmental training on there as well. The other, another motivation we have here in the example is, you know, I want to develop a new skill to get promoted, to land that new job. So I might be volunteering and I get trained in the fundamentals of how to manage a meeting because I've never really run a meeting. I haven't ever really run a team. So I learn about how to, the, the, the tactical training is agendas, um, how to run an effective meetings. But then you layer onto that the developmental where I might have to, as I'm leading a team or managing a meeting, have to negotiate or delegate. You know, I can't do it all myself. And so these are some examples of how to layer on the developmental training into these kinds of motivations as well. They live both together, training and developmental. Oh, and I like, like this, Sue, uh, professional development items for your year-end review. So that kind of fits in there too. Sometimes you might have some goals for your own professional development. Put this in there as well. I love that. So, so let's continue on with a couple more um, scenarios where we're going to develop out this even a little bit more detail. So here is our first scenario. This is a mid-level of individual with a mid-level level at their career, but they've had no management experience. They've been an ad hoc group volunteer and they're in line to step up to be the chair. So they've been a good volunteer. You wanna keep them moving. But, and this person aspires to national board service. So what are the developmental uh, training and developmental modules that you might offer this person? So here are some examples. You might give them kind of the rules and operations, the um, you know, chair responsibilities, because they're going to be moving into that, um, budgeting and financial statements. So kind of that training, tactical pieces. And then you layer onto that, you start talking to them about what is the relationship between the chapter and the national or global HQ? And what's the strategic plan? And what's the interface between them? Meeting facilitation and consensus building. So those, again, another example of how we put this all together. Now let's go over to our other mid-career professional. Now, this person actually has management experience and they have been a committee chair already and they wanna move up to more of a higher leadership. They have the potential to serve on the national governance level. So what kind of training and development would you provide to this person? Some of it is, you know, again, the chapter rules and operations, maybe introducing the governance duties and that relationship between the chapter and HQ. And you're layering in on there, public speaking and leadership development skills. So again, you pick the modules that might put together or let the person identify the modules that they need for training and development. But these are samples of what you could offer to them. One thing I really want to point out here in this, uh, this example here is that both of our volunteers are mid-career professionals with varying levels of experience, either in their professional work 
or their volunteer experience. And so you, you identify what they need and you'll see that in training, both of them are getting training on chapter rules and operations, and both of them are getting training on relationship between chapter and HQ. But in the training, there's differences too. So the modules are mix and match. Some of these modules are gonna to apply to multiple different scenarios or motivations or profiles, however you define them. But then there's gonna be others that are unique. So we wanted to show that these people are at similar levels, but they still need uniqueness in their training development modules that, that are offered to them. So I want to pause here and see, you know, does, you know, does, does, do people have ideas about how they might start to apply this and, you know, think about what the modules are that they could start offering to different uh, motivations and scenarios like this. So start putting those in the chat, the chat if you have some ideas of how you might apply some of these. And while we kind of get the chat fired up, we can also go ahead and launch our next poll, Peggy. Mm -hmm. um, because you know, we've talked about the idea of these modules, but then there are the mechanics of how to really put this into your operations of your association, your chapter. Um, and so there are different platforms that you might use for your volunteer training programs. And we want to see how many of these you're taking advantage of. So this is a check all that applies. Are you using your association's website? Are you using your AMS or your LMS if you have one? Or is it a patchwork of systems? Or maybe you've got some other platforms that you're using for your volunteer training. Put those in the chat. Online community, love that. That's a great idea. Um, those are often great resources for folks to um, share resources. Um, I'm asking about certification credit for volunteering. I don't know if this currently exists. Oh, yeah, build this into your certification. There's different ways that we might do that. Um, they don't, you don't have an LMS, so we've recorded webinar, webinars and live opportunities. And maybe you're parking those record, recorded webinars onto your website. Um, you know, this idea of using your LMS is just another way to take advantage and deliver this in that automated way that Peggy was talking about. Um, see how many ways you can integrate this in with other departments within your association. Uh, teams, everybody loves teams. That's always a good one. So Peggy, do we have most everybody? Yeah, a few do. more people voting here. People, I'm just letting the popcorn was just slowing down. <laughs> so there we go. So everybody looks like most people, well, about half of you are using the website. Um, and the next most popular, we got kind of a tie between a patchwork and other. So folks are, I think, are kind of figuring it out as they can, whatever works for their system. You know, what's the old adage? When you've seen one association or chapter, you've seen one association or one chapter. So um, it's no surprise that you're using a variety of systems. But I think our point in bringing this up is that think broadly about where you access and deliver these different training modules. You don't have to live just within your traditional offerings. So really think about how you can work with other um, units within your association or chapter to maximize the systems that you already have uh, available. The other thing to think about is what is the easiest for your volunteers to use? Um, you really want to make sure this, you know, reduce that friction. It's kind of like you want to reduce friction when somebody's joining your association. You want to reduce friction to volunteering and learning along the way. So find out ways that you can make this as easy as possible. And then that will enhance your volunteer systems as well. So I think it's back to you now, Peggy. Yeah, and I wanna, I, I love the way you have tied this idea to make it easy for the volunteer. And part of this, and the reason why we put these particular platforms on here is that for the most part, if you use almost any of these platforms, you can begin to make recorded content, um, you can begin to make um, toolkits and things accessible at the time of need based on the motivation. So if I, in that scenario set, the person who said, yeah, I, I really wanna be in national service, I know I have to figure out a path. You can say, well, if you wanna be in national service, you really need to know how to run effective meetings. And as Sue Pine said, you really need to understand um, the, the duty of foresight. And so, oh, I, I do? All of a sudden, because you've mapped that out as a requirement to where that person wants to go, and you've created this LMS or this AMS or this website where I can see what I need and find it, wow, you've put it all together. So the 
incentive that Barbara's yeah. asking about is that I want to get here. To get here requires dot, dot, and dot. And that's part of how you build the incentive into it. Now, there's lots of interesting ways of doing it. If you have an LMS, of course, you can you can use badging um, so that we, that we can get to a deeper conversation around that. But what I want to do is, is take this conversation that Christina has, has, has started and take it into what does a strategy, how do I apply this across our system? Generally speaking, and I loved... Um, uh, the responses that we just got. Generally speaking, it's useful for us to think about the online community, some kind of a resource portal, and on-demand training as critical elements in putting together a strategy that is both accessible and available, right? So what I'm really talking about is for us to stop thinking about training in terms of we have a chapter leader program, or we have four quarterly webinars, to this notion of how am I integrating learning throughout the calendar year? Where am I finding opportunities for our group, for our members to both identify learning needs by helping them see themselves on this path and by then also being able to plug in when they have that opportunity. So a 12 month strategy might look something like this. I still have my quarterly webinars I have monthly live chats. These are opportunities where I just get to gather people. I'm one, um, I'm trying to, I, I apologize. Um, I've talked to so many CRPs in this past year and a lot of you, and, and put this in the chat if this is, if this is, if, if this is a pertinent to you, have been doing kind of the, the um, ice cooler conversations where you just, you just, you just, um, or the water cooler, listen to me, ice cooler, the water cooler, you just kind of let people come in to a Zoom meeting as they need to. But that monthly live chat becomes an opportunity for people just to learn from each other. The meetup at a particular event or, in a, or, or during a sister organization's event. So one of the cool things that um, is happening over at RAPS is they are at a couple of their meetings, they're having what they call chapter, chapter meetups. And they're just informal opportunities for chapter leaders to gather and have conversations. We do, we're still gonna build in our in-person workshops. We're still, still gonna roll those um, quarterly and we're gonna do those meetups. So basically what I'm talking about is think strategically, how many different ways can I create an opportunity for my members to get together? Yeah, so, Peggy, a couple things that came in on the chat kind of related to this is the whole idea of chunking this down into the bite-sized pieces. That's you know definitely a trend with the micro learning that we all, you know, we love those, you said at the beginning, the just in time, but that's that short duration and multimodal, right? So mm -hmm. that we have all these different ways of getting the content out to people in ways that they like to consume it. Um, and then I want to say that there, there were some really fun uh, names for some of these meetups. There's chapter chats, there's um, SCA share. So folks are really kind of embracing and making this fun for folks as well. And I loved, um, Michelle mentioned about the chapter playbook and it's camp has got some amazing things there. So you guys should just, uh, it's the California Association of Marriage and Family Therapists. You should take a look at their chapter playbook, which is, which is really super cool. Did oh, you Here's see another, here's one more Peggy, rising tide webinars. Love Ooh, it. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Let's steal yeah. it. Let's absolutely, yeah. let's absolutely yeah. steal it. Um, so, and you said you set up peer groups of similarly situated, uh, similarly sized chapters that organize themselves and have their own agendas love that i mean i think that we will will um let's see how our time goes i think we might want to um have you say a word or two so get ready just in case i love the peer group idea because it really helps it takes the it takes the burden off of our shoulders um and how often do we find that our chapter leaders will listen to each other before they listen to us 100 percent right that that member to member credibility Absolutely. So I saw somebody ask. Um, uh, yes, I did. Thank you, Sarah Gardy. Um, um, it, it is camp. Yes. Um, I saw somebody ask, does anybody use the badging on LinkedIn? If you do, please um, put it in there because I would love to be able to share that. And while we are continuing this conversation and keep this conversation going, guys, because great ideas are 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 the way are the are the are the connection to innovation. Right. I want you to think in terms of diversity. I want you to get beyond this idea of 
Uh, we do our leadership training once a year and we do some webinar um, chats. And I want you to think about what can I offer 24 by seven? That's my online community. That's my portal. That's my on, do, uh, on demand. What can I do that is going to come up on a reoccurring basis so that people know it's there and they can tap in? That's your webinar, your conference call, something we have them, um, the chats, the check-ins, the virtual chats. And I know we cannot leave in person. In person is really important. It does not mean you have to have a huge leadership conference though. So um, I'm going to say it was one of the hospital associations because I worked with them a couple of times. Every other year, they took their leadership conference on the road and did three locations. Very small. They were like one day opportunities, right? Um, uh, HSMAI, Jenny um, over at HSMAI, they did something very similar. They created a, a, a road show, if you will. And, and they did that because it, it made it more accessible to more leaders, but it also allowed them to get out in the field, right? So there are different ways of doing that and meetups are incredibly valuable. And it's not just meetups at your meetings. Do you have a sister organization that has, that has a regular meeting? Go do, do a meetup there. I, one of the precious things, I don't know how many of you were um, with Cynthia Diamore. She, um, she started back when she was on the component section council, she started a, um, a fun thing called the, oh, I'm going to say it's called the CRP Connect. Anyway, at every ASAE meeting or every SAE meeting, that one of us was going to, we would put out, okay, da da da, as dinner for CRPs, and we would have everybody that was going to be in town to oh. connect that. No, it did not, it was not the organization. In, it really empower your leaders to do some of this. Also, Andy, let me just throw in yes, something please. too on the 24 7 learning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to reassure folks, you don't have to create these modules all new yourself. There are so many resources out there that you can tap into LinkedIn learning and free management, you know, pull in some of those that are good training and development modules that are on demand available for free or low cost. You don't have to create the wheel. Some of these will work well off the shelf. Absolutely. And um, we've got a couple of those in the, um, in the toolkit, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so Diana's asking the question, does anyone have suggestions to making the community effective for volunteer work? We have a thriving community, but um, getting them to actually do work. So I'm assuming that you mean when you have um, like the component section council of the, of, of the uh, ASAE, each of the councils has their own community. Um, and uh, so the, 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 Best suggestion I have, I'm going to throw right out there, um, Diana, is first of all, um, when you do agendas, you, you assign the agenda to different people on the committee. So you say to yourself, the first item is going to be X and Susie's going to be involved in that. And then um, Steve is going to handle item two. If you assign, they will look at the agenda before they show up. So just, <laughs> just one little thing I have found over the years. But please, guys, throw in there and um, give some suggestions to, um, to Diana. Um, it's really important, I think, for us to understand <laughs> this whole adult learner practices have been talked about and talked about and talked about. It's important for us to really embrace this though. It's, and, 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 and I'm not seeing it across the board in how we're doing with the components. I'm seeing that we're still trying to do lectures or, or webinars with one person talking, oops, like us. Um, there is no one adult learning theory. It's about the practices. And that's the reason why we have this word up here, practices. It's understanding that adult learners are different from children in that um, we have a great deal more autonomy as to what we're going to have and why we're going to have something. And we tend to be much more self-directed, which means we have to build in the portal. We have to think about on-demand. We have to think about worksheets that help us do some, some directed learning. The other thing is, is that it, it's gotta be practical. I mean, how many of us have time just to learn things, right? Most of us want to know that we're going to be able to apply it. We're going to be able to apply it to the goals, personal, professional, workplace, right? So 
this is where we should be using case studies. Now, I know we like to do the bright spots where somebody gets up and says, I did this and it was wonderful. Okay, but there's not, it's, you can't apply that in and of itself until you take them and sit them down and you say, let's walk, let's work through the, the questions that were asked and how we go about applying it to my own organization. How do I problem solve, right? That's a huge skill that is, that is, that is really important. And it's something we can practice. The third thing is, it has to do with the inclusion of life experiences, which is a short way of saying that adults have a really robust existing base of knowledge and life experience. Um, and that flavors what they want to learn. It also flavors what they know about something that you're trying to um, get them involved with or engaged with. And so it's really important to tap into those experiences. It's really important to help them tie back and tie forward. Lots of good things. We got a couple of, um, uh, we have uh, something at the end of the resource here and we've got stuff in our toolkit. Um, spend some time talking with, um, if you've got learning managers, um, like for example, NIGP, We've just done a five month a program, um, a training program. We took their leadership conference and split it up over five months. And part of what we did was they had a fabulous, fabulous um, learning, uh, a director of learning um, information. We brought her into the process. How do we apply the adult learning that you know to the questions that our chapter leaders are asking us? So. And I love Anne's comment here in the chat, walking, quote, walking through it is a terribly underrated teaching mode. Yeah, just walk people through it, you know, we feel so much better. So, right. yeah. Right. So, so at the end of the day, Christine, I mean, I think yeah. we leave them with uh, like what they could do next. <laughs> yeah, how to get started on this, you know, so we've, we've, we in a very compact amount of time really have introduced this idea, thrown a lot of new concepts at you. So you're kind of like, oh, what do I do now? Well, three steps, you know. So how to get started on this is to think about those pathways in the scenarios and sit down, you know, talk to a bunch of your volunteers, have a focus group, ask them what they want to learn, learn more about their motivations, aspirations. And, you know, if you take that step, then that increases their willingness to invest time in training. So go back to what the, the with them, right? What, you know, what do they need? What's in it for them? Help them understand that. So take that time to start asking and being learner centric with your volunteers, engaging them in a discussion about the pathways. Then you start to identify exactly what it is that the volunteers need to know. So these are the effective practices and chapter management operations, guidelines, et cetera. So you're gonna enhance the idea of what it is that they're going to learn and build awareness of the volunteer skills that are needed to be successful. Um, then third is plot your course forward. Go big or go small. You know, make this fit your association, your chapter's um, capacity to take this on and phase it out. So, you know, and one of the things that I, I kind of want to go back to is this idea of um, volunteers understanding what they need to do. So one of the things that is very helpful is this idea of self-assessment. Um, you know, and getting them to do that step is really important. Guide, giving them guiding questions, interview them in different ways, and then build that volunteer orientation so that they can say, oh, this is my self-assessment. These are the modules that I think I need. And include that in your orientation and onboarding process um, for your new volunteers so that they have gone through that self-assessment. You've told them up front, this is what you need to be successful do that honest self-evaluation and then give them the tools and the modules, those stackable micro units that they can take on. So mixing it all together with the volunteer matrix, the pathway, you outline the keys to success. You know, um, I love this, uh, this idea is that it's far easier to help a volunteer towards being successful in a goal rather than is just saying, you're not qualified or they tried to step into a leadership role and they failed because you hadn't prepared them appropriately. So really think about this idea of making that mutual relationship, right? Where you want them to be successful. You want to give them the tools to be successful. And then you also encourage them to have that self-assessment and to take on those pieces of training that will help them be successful as volunteers and as professionals. So, you know, 
take this and make this fit your um, your own. You know, do a little piece at a time. You know, think about how this supports your chapters. You know, apply the concepts to your existing chapter leader conference, for example, or how to enhance the webinars. I love Peggy's idea of talking to your learning team, your education team. You know, maybe they have some leadership development modules already there that you can pull into your chapter training as well or your volunteer training. Develop that resource portal. Even if it's not an LMS, maybe you can create a section of your website. Make it work for you. You know, you can also apply this to national committees or chapter level committees. This is not just for chapter folks, but these are for committees as well. How can you apply these processes to onboarding for, say you've got a program committee, for example, you can apply the same tactics there. So just as there are all these different paths for volunteers for their learning journeys, there are just as many pathways and um, experiences and journeys for you in developing your program. Make this work for you. Again, I said this at the beginning, we're busy. You know, we, we don't want this just to be one more thing for you to have to think about. Make this fit for you. Take a small chunk, take a small step, try it on, make it fit, adapt it. You know, I think that if you can just do one or two things, you'll love the way that this enhances your program. So having said that, I think we are um, moving on to the resources, right? Right, right. But let me just pause for a moment because I yeah. love the fact that, uh, I guess I'm going to say your name right, I hope so, Abenya. Um, there is a presentation on volunteer assessments at the ASAE annual. There is, um, and I've been in contact with the three presenters, um, and uh, I, I'm doing a really cool interview with them because th what they're doing is 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 truly it's it's fabulous what they're sharing, and what's really interesting if you look at AHIMA, um, which is the Health Information Management Association, I think I got that right. They did this. They had a group of volunteers pulled together to create a competencies framework, which turned into a really easy self assessment. Now, no one's really judging it, but you get to go up there and it says all of these things at these different levels. This is what you need. It's a very super simple, and you can go Ahima volunteer assessment. I think you'll get to it. If not, I mean, we've got a link. Actually, we have, a, I believe we have a link in the toolkit as well. Mm -hmm. What's what's beautiful ab about this is someone asked, how do I motivate them to actually go to the on-demand? They're motivated when they, when, when they have a what's in it for me, right? They're motivated. Oh, great. They're, they're motivated by this notion of, of it's taking me someplace. What we haven't done at this point, instead we've simply said, here's your job description. This is everything I need you to know. And we do these leadership conferences where we put all the treasures in one place, regardless of where they are mentally or skill-wise, and we walk them through how to do a budget. Okay, guys, so there's a couple of misses here. And, and, and the misses are that they're gonna be doing their email or they're gonna be just half listening if it's not in their motivational thing. Yes, they need to have it. So then the question is, how do you take, let's all together put together a budget for a small chapter. So now you're doing practical. The people who know something can be part of that peer-to-peer -peer learning. The people that are learning are hearing, they're seeing their peer-to-peers. Anyway, lots of really great things. And Anessa, thank you, thank you, thank you. I just think the moon and stars and everything of this really cool leadership competencies that you guys have done. So thanks for, thanks, thanks for sharing that. Um, but anyway, let me let me let me put the next slides because um, we got two minutes left, Peggy. And so I think we have two slides left. So we're right on story. So we have a number of resources available for you um, and you'll get the links to all of these. But, you know, they are different ways for you to think about, you know, framing your journey, how you might set this up. You know, thinking about adult learner practices. Uh, so there's a lot of really great resources there. So take a look at all of these different resources, um, you know, flip through them at least a little bit and you know, pull in the pieces that you think you need to get, at least get started on your pathway for developing this volunteer learning journey. So having said that, I think we are almost, oh, so sad. We don't have much time for observations. Well, we do, the chat, we have the chat open. Yeah. <laughs> So do share any thoughts on this, um, anything we didn't cover uh, or questions you might have, or you're ready to get going. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. And there's, I'm gonna really suggest that you, you know, download the free toolkit 
um, in part because we've got some additional examples there and some additional resources for you guys to look at. And I also like to mention that both um, Christine and I, can you tell, love to talk about this. So <laughs> give us a ring. Um, you'll get our contact information. Give us a ring because we're happy to say if you, something doesn't make sense and you're scratching your head, give us a ring. Let us talk. Let us, let us for sure um, walk you through any of the questions that you have. I want to mention just um, real quickly, um, thanking Bill Highway again. They consistently help us put on these great things. Um, and it's always, uh, always a real pleasure. And one last thing I want to mention is um, Mariner Management, and actually Christine's involved too, is um, we, we are now doing the ASAE Foundation's research on um, new models for volunteering. I'm going to hope that all of you on this call, you're interested in volunteer development. When you get that request, we're looking for people to interview, one-on-one -on -one interviews. We're looking for people to be on focus groups. We're looking for people to do a survey, and we're looking for associations that want their volunteers surveyed. Four ways to get involved as we continue this conversation. Hey, thank you. It's a pleasure. Christine, I love it. Can we do this again? I can't wait. I'm sure we have the next version two of this coming at some point. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks for spending some time with us today. Have a great day.